anything. Uh, so, Oriel, the floor is yours. Okay, great. So, first of all, I'm really happy to be here and to present you two of our recent work, one on uh, stochastic quantum simulation, so mainly using uh, input sampling to reduce actual implementation cost. And the second is a more, uh, you know, a NISC experiment uh, to compute like response function for scattering experiment. So let's just begin with like the, I want just to set the setting. So the task we want to do is doing quantum simulation. So we want to use a quantum computer to simulate, you know, quantum physical system. So the way it works is that you have a Hamiltonian, you just evolve it in time. And this is equivalent to solving the time independent Schrodinger equation. Of course, this is, we want to do this because classically it's kind of a challenging task because of the scaling of the Hilbert space. And since the scaling is only polynomial for, if you use a quantum device, you might be able to solve really interesting problem using uh, quantum computers. Uh, the setting we want to address here is like in bit ahead in the future where we have, let's say a few error corrected qubits. So you don't have any noise but still you have like limitation in terms of the number of qubits and also the depth you can you can pro, you, you can have so you don't have arbitrary error correction so you want to design really algorithms that are as shallow as possible and as and have a low overhead so we want basically we want to have better algorithm for uh, quantum simulation of course, uh, quantum simulation has a lot of application in particular in physics, but also in other fields. Uh, I guess the first application we have all in mind is you know, computation of the spectrum. So computing the eigenvalues of some Hamiltonian. And this you can do via quantum field estimation, which has as a subroutine uh, time evolution. Other application may also include you know, computation of dynamical properties such as response function, as we see um, in the end of the talk, but also, you know, correlators, spin dynamics, density of states, phase diagram, etc. And here on the right, you see um, like the phase diagram of some Ising chain, more precisely uh, the, the ANI model where we have an Ising chain plus uh, next next table interaction. And basically we're able to draw the phase diagram using uh, quantum machine learning techniques. And this is phase diagram really cool because you can get you know microscopic insight about um, microscopic physic, uh, physical system. Um, okay, so now we have, we know what you want to do, we know why you want to do it, and now we go more into the details how to do it. So this is a bit the outline of the talk. Uh, the first part is going to introduce you know uh, time evolution via the Q drift protocol, which is a stochastic way to build. Um, product formula and then we'll go to the main part of the talk which is how to reduce the cost with, with, using input sampling so this is really the focus of our work uh, then we go to composite channel which is a way to improve uh, to reduce the cost further and improve the accuracy and in the end we see some numerical simulation on some lattice uh, field theory and in the end we'll go to this response function experiment on the uh, NISC device Okay, let's go to QDrift. So the setting is you are given a Hamiltonian that you can write as such. So some coefficient small h and some generators big H. And you assume that you can evolve all of this, the, the individual term, you can evolve them easily. And what you are asked is just provide the evolution operator, which is solution to the time independent Schrodinger equation. Um, how can you do this? So in practice, like the most easy thing you could think of is doing like a first order a Tartar uh, formula where basically you take all the terms sequentially and you just evolve them. And then you, you build your circuit just as, you know, product of the individual terms. So it's like you have this luggage at the airport and you just take one as they arrive, you just take one, you evolve it and that's it. And then you can show that the errors uh, scales as a uh, T squared. Of course, this is maybe the, most easy thing you can do, you can easily build um, higher product formula. So like second order is the same, but you just apply a first order formula, formula with T over two, and then you apply the same in reverse. So you have this 
you know, forward uh, evolution, backward evolution, and then this is a second order total, total formula which scales a bit better. So you can increase basically the scaling with uh, the error scaling with t. Okay, and if t is small, uh, if t is more than one, then this is going to be better and better as you increase your formula. Um, the main drawback though is that, as you see, the number of terms it scales with L. So here we have it scaled with L, then you have two L, and basically it's in a linear L. So it's not that bad, it's not exponentially bad, but if H has a lot of terms, like for example, in chemistry or nuclear physics, uh, is going to be a limiting factor. So what we want, basically, we want to have methods that don't depend explicitly on L. And the way we can do it is using uh, QDraft, which is a random compiler proposed by uh, Campbell a few years ago. And basically here, you don't have any, you build your, your circuit randomly. So you have all the terms like sitting in this lottery uh, bowl, and you just pick one at random, you evolve it, then you pick another one, you evolve it, you pick another one, et cetera, et cetera. So here, you don't have any sequential ordering, you just sample and you evolve and if you do this using a, a, a well chosen sampling distribution p which it basically depends only on the the coefficient and uh, also a smart chosen time tau which depends on the, the evolution time lambda which is the norm of your hamiltonian and n which is the number of sampling terms then if you do this you can control you can show that this is like an unbiased estimator of the true evolution so if you keep n large enough, you will uh, go towards the, the true uh, channel. So maybe what's like the um, intuition to have is really the terms which are a large h, so they have a large coefficient, they are more important. So you have to, to basically you, you should sample them more often. And as you see, the time here is always the same, so you don't have the coefficient explicitly in the time, but since you are going to sample more often the terms which are more important, in the, on average, it's going to be the same. Uh, so you can re really, you can do it really rigorously, so you can show that if you do all these choices, then uh, if you choose n large enough, so larger than t squared lambda square over epsilon, you will be epsilon close from the true channel. So this is really cool. You have now a way to build a product formula uh, whose length doesn't depend explicitly on L. Of course, L appears here in the norm of the, the Hamiltonian, so it depends implicitly on L, but not at least not explicitly. Um, so maybe we can go into more details of how this all this thing is working. So basically, the QDRIFT channel you can express it as as such, so basically you have you sum over all possible terms in your Hamiltonian and you evolve them with some probability. So this is your channel. And then if you do like a Taylor expansion of the exponential as such, then you can write it as a first order channel plus some high contribution terms. And if you do the same for the exact channel with time t over n, so you do exactly the same, then you show that if you choose tau as t lambda over n, you have basically the same first order contribution. And then the rest is going to be something else, but we don't care. We only want to match the exact channel at first order. And then the errors, you can bound it. So in diamond norm, you can, if you do the distance between those two and you use subjectivity to bring the n before the norm, then you can show that the error is bounded as t lambda of n squared. Okay, so maybe more formally, what you have is that you have individual quantum circuits, V, that are built as product of uh, individual terms, where, you know, these JK are a sample uh, at random, and you just multiply them. And then in the more general setting, you could also average over those quantum circuits, so you can build a more general channel that depends also on M. And here, M is just, you know, you average over M repetition of your channel. So this is like the most general definition of your QDF channel that you could think of. Okay, so this is what you know has been proposed in the past years. And now what we want to, to do is dig a bit more into the actual cost of this when you want to go to the hardware. 
Okay, so you want to use input sampling to reduce the cost. So basically, until now, we like assume that every um, term in your product, you you have access like to some oracle. You call it the oracle, and then you apply this time evolution, and you assume that every oracle has the same cost. So you don't really care if you evolve a term A or B. They all they are, it's assumed that they all cost the same. However, in reality, it's not as simple. So you have like terms which are easy to implement and some others that are more difficult. So we would like to find a way to take this into account. So the idea is really, we want to sample from another distribution, so not the same as before, another Q. And we want to do this in a way that we achieve some kind of cost reduction. And the way we can probably do this with input and sampling. So input the sampling is really, uh, you know, really popular trick in Monte Carlo for various reduction, predictions. So the way it works is that if you want to compute some kind of expectation and value according to P, you can always multiply it by one. And then this is basically the same as computing the expectation value according to a new distribution Q for uh, a new function F multiplied by this relevating factor omega, which is basically just uh, the ratio between P and Q. So it tells us that if you input the sampling, the bias is the same but the variance is going to change. So you can like trick your, uh, your sampling to have better variance. So to need less sample basically to, to do your, um, your expectation value estimation. So the way we, we did it, so we just write, you know, the important sampling channel, which now we have like an arbitrary distribution Q. You do, you write, uh, instead of having this, we write it using the Leovillian um, representation, then you do Tyler expansion as before, and then we say, okay, we want this to match the exact channel at first order, so we want to choose tau j q j in order to patch it. So if you choose tau j to be t h a n q j like this, then we do this to to ensure that both channels match at first order. So there is basically two difference with respect to the traditional uh, q drift. So the first is that uh, now tau is dependent on j. So before it was independent, it was always the same. Now it depends on j, okay? And it also depends on the sampling probability q, like this. And if you choose q as h, j over lambda, as they do in the traditional q-drift, you recover q-drift. So, so this new theory is just a generalization of uh, what we had before. So it's nothing really new, it's just a generalization. Okay. So what can we show for this importance and Q-drift? The first thing we can show is that it's an unbiased estimator and that the bias is like, the error on the bias is bounded via T squared on the square of N, so the same as before. And now we have this one plus expression value of P of omega. This is like the new, the difference between the traditional Q-drift and it's always greater than one. So it's not, so it tells us that the bound is like bigger than for traditional Q drift. So if you use the traditional Q drift, uh, this guy is one. And in general, this is always going to, going to be bigger. So it tells us already that the, the bound is, is going to be more loose. Okay. So we have an unbiased estimator, but the error is a bit the, the error bound is a bit bigger. The one thing we can say is concentration. So how well uh, does my, my channel concentrate around the true channel? So basically what we showed is like the probability of the channel to be, to have like more than an epsilon distance to the true channel is like upper bounded by this expression, which is a bit ugly, but the, the only important thing is that it's like exponential in n times m. So it concentrates exponentially fast in the number of samples towards the true uh, channel. So this is really good. So basically you need only a few samples to have a good uh, channel. So this is, okay, this is just, so before, so in the work by the Catholic people, they only have the same, but with N. So they have M equal to one. So here we show that if you want to average over curved circuits, you can increase further the concentration. 
So if you don't want to have n really big, you can reduce n and instead increase m, and it should be the same. So, so maybe more uh, formally, if you choose nm to be like this, then you are sure to be epsilon close with probability one minus delta. Okay. So what we learn in this slide is that in polytonic Q drift is unbiased, concentrates exponentially fast, but it, it's a bit less good than before because now we have this, um, instead of one, we have this expression value of omega. So the price to pay is that we need to increase n to have the same accuracy. Okay, so we have like this uh, this price because we don't sample from you know the maybe the best distribution, so we have this price to pay. Okay, so it will tell me okay why do we want to do this? We have to do more samples. It's not really convenient, but of course there is a reason, and the reason is the oracle they don't cost the same, and this is what you want to see in this uh, in this section. So let's say each. Um, generators as like a cost CL. Okay, so CL represents like the cost of actually uh, evolving the term on the hardware. And then let's say you want to sample from this distribution instead. So basically you weigh each term according to the cost. So the terms which cost a lot, you want to sample less, less often and vice versa. And then if you do this, we can show that the um, the cost actually, so, so the real cost is, is always going to be smaller for the impotent sample QDF than for the, the traditional one. And the way it works is that, okay, we know that for impotent sample QDF, you need more samples, but on average, each sample is going to cost less. So in the end, you are going to win. This is what this, uh, what we showed in this, uh, in this work. So if you do this, you're going to work all the, uh, you're going to win all the time with respect to, uh, the traditional curve drift at same accuracy. Okay, so maybe how can we choose this C? So I guess the easiest way to 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 de decide what C is is basically just like counting the number of two qubit native gates you need to implement it. So like the number of C naught. Like you just transpile your term, you count the, 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 the you count the number of two qubit gates, and this is your cost. You could also take into account like connectivity issue. So if you have terms that you can like implement natively on your hardware, or if you have to like swap around, they could cost more. And you could also take into account like non-locality of your uh, operators. Maybe something even more interesting would be to reduce the number of key gates. Okay, because if you have error correction, usually how it works is that you will like write your secret as Clifford plus T gates. The Clifford gates are easy to simulate classically, so you don't care about those. And the, you only care about the, the, the number of T gates, so you want to minimize that. So what you could do is you start from a distribution Q, which is close to P, so you can choose Q equal to P, and then you do some kind of Monte Carlo um, iteration to drift towards a distribution which is close to P, while uh, the the time so the AJ, this is actually the, the the evolution time is close to an integer time spy because if this is true then it's going to have you know a low uh, an efficient transpiration in terms of T gate so we want to minimize the number of T gate T gates while being close to the actual distribution so this could be something we didn't really explore but this is this would be really cool on error correct devices so we now we we finished. Uh, the QDrift section, I want to do a small summary. So QDrift is a stochastic channel that builds a random product formula whose length doesn't depend on the number of terms. It's really good for Hamiltonians uh, where the, the coefficients are, are not distributed uniformly. So if you have like a lot of terms with small coefficient and a few big, like you have in chemistry, then people from Caltech in this paper, they show that QDrift channel concentrates really well, so you can basically keep n small. What we showed in our paper is that you can use input sampling to reduce the cost, and that the concentration uh, generalizes with nm instead of just n. And finally, maybe 
maybe heard of it, but a few weeks ago, people from Toronto, they, they implemented a higher order Q drift. So basically they have Q drift, they added correction terms and they call it Q shift. So with this, you can reduce, uh, basically what you can do is you can, the, 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 the diamond norm distance, you can, it will scale as lambda t square of n. This is, this is uh, what we what we had. And then they just uh, take the exponent k. So you can exponentially decrease the error. So this is also really exciting. Okay. Now we we saw what is QDrift. We saw to use input sampling to reduce the cost. And now we want to, to ask ourselves, okay, can we do better? Can we maybe use um, composite channel? Can we use um, different type of quantum simulation techniques for a different scenario. So composite channel, um, basically the, the idea is that you have given a partition of your Hamiltonian, so you write H as A plus B, let's say, and then you say, okay, A would be really great for a throttle channel, while B would be really great for a theory channel. And then you cannot really decide which one to use, so composite channel tells you, okay, you can use actually both. So you want to simulate A using Trotter and B using QDrift. Okay, so you might want to do this. So basically you apply Trotterization for A multiplied by QDrift for B. And people, uh, so this was proposed by those people in this paper. And basically they show that, so the, the error that you do doing this is basically the errors of uh, the trotter error in the A term. So this is basically just uh, the error bound written with the commutators. Then you have the mixed term error, so the commutators between A and B. And then you have the Q drift errors written with input sampling. Okay, so now the game really now is really to choose A and B in order to minimize this bound. So you want to you want to choose an A that, you know, a lot of those terms are zero, so they commit a lot. You want to choose B with a small a lambda, so with small coefficient in order to minimize this guy, and if possible, also minimize this guy. So you can really play games, order your Hamiltonian in order to have really the best a combination. And really, what is great about composite chunks is that they usually are better than the sum of the parts, so you always gain something more by using composite channels. Um, and that you can really tailor your uh, time evolution operators to your system. So if you have really specific subsystem with different properties, you can make use of that to have the really best uh, channel. Um, a good question to ask is, okay, how can we choose a partition? So of course it's not a trivial task. Um, maybe the first thing that comes into mind is perturbation theory. So let's say I have, I have H, which is, Describe as A, which is like the bulk, the main theory, and then you have some small deviation. So you have like uh, this uh, beta, which is small, and which is like this perturbation. And so you could say, okay, so this guy is going to be small, so I can use Q drift on this one, and I just use totalization for A. That's a good choice. Another choice could be to consider the cost. So you want to have in A, you know you're going to simulate every term. So you want to have the easiest term in A, while in B, you only sample, right? So you can have the most difficult terms. You could do something also, you know, uh, connectivity oriented. So you could bring into A all the terms that like can be run with the same connectivity in order to minimize, you know, the swap uh, overhead. And B, you have the remaining terms that you need to do swaps to, to run them. So you can really play A, play, play a lot with those things. And really the, 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 I mean, the most exciting for me, which we didn't really explore a lot in our paper, but uh, that we would like to do in the future is really having a T-gate efficient decomposition. So if you take TH, so time times Hamiltonian, you can write it like this, and you can split it basically like this way, here I just add zero. So I, I do plus kj pi minus kj pi, so I do nothing. But now we can see, okay, if I choose kj to be integers, this is going to be integer time pi. So this is going to be uh, efficiently 
um, T gate efficient. So it's going to be have a low T gate overhead. And if this guy is small, so if the angle is small, then this is going to be perfect for Q drift. So I can use a total channel on this one. I have a low T gate overhead, and then I use Q drift on the remaining part, which should be small. So what you could probably do is use some kind of genetic optimization or Monte Carlo iteration to, to find the distribution such that this is small while k is like an integer. That would be something really cool to uh, that you want to so try out in the future. Um, okay, so I think uh, we, we led a bit the uh, whole the, the theory uh, for quantum simulation that we, we did for the remaining of the talk, which is basically a few application and a few uh, numerics. So the system we are interested in is lattice effective uh, field theory. So it's going to be describing nucleon moving on a lattice. So we are taking a square lattice, M times M. We are taking A nucleons in NF different spaces. And now we have Hamiltonian described their interaction. So we have like a kinetic part here that allow particle to move from site A to J. So here I destroy one and J and I create at I, so they move. I have two body and three body on site interaction. So they particle can interact when they are on the same site. And then what we also have here is like uh, the potential of a frozen nucleon. So we choose one, one nucleon to be frozen. So it cannot move from site to one. And then we have uh, the potential created by this guy. To be more precise, we choose two by two lattice and only two dynamical nucleon with a frozen one. And we use, so it looks like this. So we have this lattice. We have one frozen nucleon on the red side and two that are moving around. Okay, we need, now we have this Hamiltonian written, you know, in second quantization. We need to map it to a qubit Hamiltonian. We can do, I guess, two things. The first, the easiest one is use Jordan Wigner. So you just use one site per qubit. And if the qubit is zero, it's empty. If it's uh, one, it's occupied. So you need like m square nf qubits, or you use first quantization, where basically you use the state zero zero to describe this site zero one one zero and one one etc. So you have like a log m square and uh, you only need log square log m square qubits. So it's more qubit efficient, but it's a bit less trivial to understand what's happening. So we choose the first because we have then less qubits and it's a bit um, and also for this really simple model it has really nice uh, Hamilton formulation for quantization. Third one thing so we say we want to do composite channel on this so we need to do a choice of the partition so we, we consider two different <clears throat> two different scenarios the first one is the perturbation theory one so we have a that describes the bulk of the system so when we have the choice u equal minus 4v. So this is, if you do this case, most of the terms are going to cancel each other. So it's a more simple uh, Hamiltonian. And then b is just the rest. So a linear interpolation from this setting to a more realistic uh, case. In the second um, scenario, we have um, a, that contains the easy terms, so like the single qubit gates and the one that can be, you know, run without uh, swapping around. And in B, we have the most expensive one plus some easy to like have a good sampling distribution. So maybe here um, in the table, you have all the different generators and the cost they they require to be implemented in practice. Note that we use uh, a linear connectivity between one, four, two, and three. So it's why this guy is expensive because one and three are like four parts. We need to swap both of them in order to run it. So this is like the cost to so the number of C naught they need to be uh, implemented. And this one are not zero because we don't want to have um, uh, z I mean, if you divide by, by zero, you're going to have the, uh, you know, infinity. So it's not going to be really practical to choose a uh, non-zero cost. Okay, so this is the two setting and we did some numerics. So we did basically four tests. So one with different time. So the first column and the second column. 
and the row are basically here. This is the perturbation theory uh, splitting, and this is the cost efficient splitting. Those guys are basically just the diamond norms between the, the channel and the true evolution against the ratio B over A. So basically we have H equal A times big A plus B times big A, uh, big B, sorry. And so B and A is just like the, the, the importance ratio between the two uh, splitting in the Hamiltonian. So we have <clears throat> the dashed here, the line, they are a uh, traditional Q-drift with n equal to one and different n. And the dots, they are the uh, important sending Q-drift with n equal to one and n equal to 10. Trotter is in black. So we see that accuracy is great. Trotter is always a bit better, but on average, they're all doing like kind of the same, the same job. I would say the most, um, like the figure of merit really of this year is are really more the, um, the histograms here. So they describe how often do you sample a circuit with this cost. So it, it, it tells you what is the cost of your simulation. So basically, um, uh, so, okay, so this is like the probability of sampling circuit with this cost. And what we see is that if you do Q drift, you're here. So you have like those um, expensive circuit that you sample quite a lot. So maybe 10% of the time. But if you do input the samplings, these are, these are going to be reduced by a lot. Note that the, this is a log scale. So this is really tiny. And uh, you are going to sample really the, the easiest circuit most of the time. Why? We, without sacrificing the accuracy. So like this line are basically the expectation values. So we see that we bring the expectation value from here to here. This is a charter, which is uh, really high because you need to sample everything. I mean, you run everything, so it's really going to be high. And this is really magnified in a second scenario where we have really this cost efficient splitting. And here we see that we can really have like a factor of six improvement in the cost between charter and um, uh, input sampling Q drift. So it's really great. So we have like same accuracy, but a much more better uh, cost. So maybe now it's a great time to take any question on the Q drift on the Q drift part of the talk because then I'm going to move a bit into a more a different theme. So if there is any question, I'm happy to to answer. It seems we don't have questions on the chat. Uh, and nobody is raising the hand, so maybe we can continue. I don't okay, know. so I will just continue. So now we are, uh, we want to go into a more you know a more um, NISC approach, or you want to use NISC devices to compute um, response function. So the setting we we are considering is just you know, the scattering of some neutrino on a nuclei. So we have a nuclei which is described by a Hamiltonian. And we start in the ground state of the nuclei. So this is the same uh, Hamiltonian as before. So it's a two by two lattice uh, effective field theory. So it's exactly the same Hamiltonian. And we have this interaction, which is described by uh, momentum, a momentum transfer. So it's going to be to apply this. So the, the scattering, we just modelize using this kind of operators. And what we want, we want to compute a linear response function, so S, um, which is basically you know the sum over the transition amplitude between the excited ground state and all possible uh, uh, state of eigenstate of the Hamiltonian times this uh, data function. So it looks roughly like this. Of course, <clears throat> you cannot compute this in practice because this you need to know the full spectrum. You need to know everything. So if if you it's a bit too difficult. So what we want instead is having like to use some kind of approximation. So you can do an integral trans transform using like a Gaussian kernel. You truncate it, and if you do this like uh, in a nice way, you can show that it is sufficient to compute um, this kind of values that depends basically 
only on the expectation value of the time evolution operators applied to an excited state. So you have the ground state, you apply excitation to time evolution, you do expectation value of this. And if you do, you sum for a different time and different coefficient that depends on the kernel, and you, you sum all of them, you can have like a good approximation um, of S. So what we do with so we, we assume that um, the ground state we we obtain it using you know a version of quantum eigen solver which is prepare like a trial state on the quantum device and just optimize the parameters to minimize the energy and this guy uh, this is the only thing we want to compute on the quantum device and they're quite easy right they are just expectation value so we only need the quantum computer to compute this thing and all the rest is then uh, classical. Um, so basically we need like a few ingredients. So the first ingredient is, okay, preparing the ground state, you can use a VQE. Uh, then you apply excitation, you apply time evolution, and then you need to compute the expectation value. And to compute the expectation value is not trivial because the observable is not just a poly string. So it's like a complex uh, unitary matrix. So you need something a bit more involved and what we, can use is like a hadamard test. So you use an ancilla in its position, you do control time evolution, hadamard back, and then if you measure the, expect the expectation value of this, you are going to get the real point of this expectation value. And if you add the here and uh, the S gate, S dagger, then you, you will have the imaginary part of it. But it's a great way to, to get this uh, expression by you using just an ancillary activity and a control time evolution. In practice, because so this is quite in practice, you want to to also compute this control u, which can be difficult. But if all the u are easy, like product formula, you can basically just control each individual term in your product. Okay, and this can be done in this way. So let's say you want to control set a set j then you just so you can write set set as c not z c not and then you control everything and then you can see that you can instead just do this and the way to see it is that okay if the ancilla is zero then i apply i don't have apply this guy but i apply c not c not which is the identity and so i apply nothing and if this is one then i apply set set so this is really what i want to do Okay, so this is great. However, doing control, I need like one control operation per term. So it can be quite expensive on this device. So what you want to do is use control vessel gate to avoid the control operation. So control vessel gates are great because they uh, they can avoid this, uh, this problem. So you just need to find R that anti commutes with H. So you have this. And if this is true, then you can use it to toggle the flow of time. So basically, if you apply R, then because they anti-commute, you are going to have a time evolution in the opposite direction. Okay. And then what you do is that you do the test this way. So if this is zero, you apply R. So you do time evolution backwards. If this is one, you do time evolution forward. And because you choose T over two, you're going to have a two phase contribution of half the time. So since we only care about phase difference, they're going to add up to the full phase uh, phase shift. And so we get the same information as the Hadamard test, but without doing the control U. Of course, it might not be easy to find a good R. And sometimes you also need to like break H into a sum of, you know, you need to split H, find R for each sub terms, and also then include them between the trial steps. So it might be quite expensive, but we can show that if the system size is large enough. So if like N is uh, smaller than the total number of terms, you will win every time by using these techniques. And in fact, for us, for our case, we, we really find a really good R, so which has like a really low uh, overhead. So we can basically avoid this control operation. Okay, we want to go on this device. We need error mitigation, this is clear, because if you use current, I mean, IPM devices, uh, you're not going to go really, really far. So we consider multiple techniques, which are 
cheap in terms of additional sampling and which are all like based on purification techniques like uh, future insulation, cell purification, etc. So here I want to, to explain a bit what future insulation is. And really the goal is to use multiple copies of your uh, state of interest to suppress a non-dominating component. So we know that quantum circuit, they only express, you know, pure state. And if you have noise, you are going to have a state which is like uh, density matrix, so not pure. And so the idea is say, okay, if the noise is if the noise is small enough, then what I want is a true is the, the, the closest pure state. Okay. So if you like express rho as you know probability over uh, eigenstates and you consider the power of m, then you see that you're just going to multiply p times uh, power m. And so if the p are small, they're going to be even smaller. And so this will drift towards the closest uh, pure state. And then you can compute expectational value using uh, this power of rho, where we renormalize everything to have uh, the, 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 the good normalization. Of course, you don't really want to compute exponent of rho. So what you can do is instead of using copies in parallel like this, so this is rho, you compute in parallel, then you like um, link them, link every qubit using like this diagonizing gate. And then by merging everything, you can compute this value. Uh, maybe what you can see from this is that you need a lot of connectivity. So you need to connect every qubit. So it might be expensive. And also this gate, the diagonizing gate can be quite challenging also if you have a lot of copies, so it might also not be worth it. Uh, what is really cool in our case is that we do a Hadamard Hadama test. So you only need to connect the ancilla. So you do a Hadamard test, you only connect the ancilla and you, do, you can only measure those ones. So really, you don't have that much of a connectivity uh, requirement. The second technique where we use is self-verification. And here the idea is to correct depolarizing noise. So let's say you have depolarizing noise. So you have your, your pure state C1 that is mapped to this state through the depolarizing channel. And then let's say you want to compute like a spectrum value of P where P is like a poly operators. Since P is traceless, this is going to vanish. So you only have this contribution. And now you can say, okay, if I know P, then you can correct, right? Because then what I want is this. I only have this. But if I know P, I can divide and I have uh, that true expression value. Okay, how do you get P? This is a, a different question. And what we tried is to use like a similar circuit that we know already what is the, uh, the exact result to estimate P. So what we do is that you like prepare C2, so consider C2, which is basically uh, you prepare your state. Time, so this is uh, like a ground state. Then you apply time evolution, inverse time evolution, you unprepare the state. And then basically this is just the identity. And so you know that uh, this is going to give you one. So if you like compute the expectation value of Q on this state, you have same as before, it's going to be zero because uh, Q is traceless. <coughs> And then if this is one and you measure this, you know P, right? So then you can correct. And if you do the mass, then what you get at the end is, okay, you have this correction uh, expression value. It's just what you get out of the device divided by uh, this guy, why this is uh, basically one minus P. Note that it only works for even number of trotter steps. So you need to be able to do two trotter steps in order to do this. Okay. And the last uh, thing we, we consider is poly twirling, which is not meant to be a standalone technique. It's really meant to help other LMD techniques. So poly twirling is a really great way to add stochasticity uh, to the noise and to make it more depolarizing. So basically, poly twirling, it takes a noisy operator and turn it into a poly channel with a gate conjugation. So 
let's say you have this operator m that you want to run, you can con con you can take a set w and you conjugate m with every gate in this set. And then this is your 12 circuit. Here you have an example. If you have, want to run the C0, you can conjugate it using this sigma uh, gate. And then this is just a noise. And you can then show that all of this combination uh, lead to you know, uh, circuit which are equivalent. Okay. And in practice, of course, you don't want to sum over everything. You just want to sample a few of them and average. Okay, so this is only 20. And of course, you can use it uh, extra on every other aeronautic techniques. So it doesn't really increase the cost because you will run more circuits, but you can decrease the number of shots, and in the end, it doesn't have enough ahead. Okay, last uh, slide, the result. So we did two tests, one test with one trot step and the second order uh, trotter product Wagner, and the second with a two trotter step because we want to use two different techniques. So the first one, we use virtual insulation on the first one and self amplification on the second one. We use uh, IBM device, so uh, IBM Kolkata, a 27-bit machine from uh, IBM Q. Um, <clears throat> this is the number of like, uh, C0. So with linear connectivity, this is uh, um, an IBM device, how many C0 you need for running the circuit. And this is if you had like a trapped iron device without a connectivity requirement. So you see, you can still reduce by a lot if you don't have this uh, connectivity requirement. So in black, you have the exact result. In green, you have the simulated uh, result. In yellow, you have the raw result. And in pink, you have with the purification techniques. The crosses are with, uh, the crosses are without twirling and the dots with twirling. So we see two things. So first, we see that virtualization doesn't help at all. So virtual insulation here does nothing. And this is probably because the noise is too great. So probably the noise, probably the closest pure state is not the state we want. In fact, we did experimentation on noisy backend, so with a simulated noise. And if you have a low level of noise, then VD actually helps. So this is really a matter of noise is too big. And what is really great though, is that if you do twirling and self application you can really get something that is close to what you want. So here, what is really uh, interesting is that without twirling, self application doesn't help. That's because the noise is not depolarizing. But if you use twirling, it's going to be more uh, depolarizing and you can use then self application to correct it. Um, so as a conclusion, we saw that QDrift uh, is a protocol to generate random product formulas, and both size does not depend on the number of terms. We saw that we can use input sampling to reduce the, the actual implementation cost on the hardware by taking into account uh, transpilation, connectivity issue, etc., and that we still have the same um, accuracy. So we we really have like an improvement in the cost without. Uh, having uh, to sacrifice accuracy. We saw what our composite channel, and we saw how we can use it to basically make the best out of each technique and to tailor really your quantum simulation technique to your particular Hamiltonian. Um, and finally, we, we did some experiment with a response function, which are basically a uh, response function to give you information about the cross section. So they're interesting for uh, energy physics um, problems. And they can be computed, they can be estimated from expectation values. So, this is something which is easy for quantum device. And we saw that uh, self fabrication and tooling are really uh, good methods that works well together uh, when running on noisy, on real uh, noisy backend. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank again my collaborators, Michael Grossi and uh, Alessandro Roggero. And here's the link uh, to the paper about the QDrift. And the paper about the response function is going to be uh, part of mine soon. So <clears throat> thanks a lot, Oriel. It has been very interesting. And well, consider yourself with a virtual clapping because we are not in the same room. Uh, now, uh, before we run into the questions, uh, let me remind you for those who just joined slightly after the introduction, 
uh, that uh, we are seeking, looking for uh, volunteers or uh, potential contributors to this uh, lecture cycle. Uh, the lecture cycle is essentially composed of uh, two, two, two sorts of contribution. One is like Oriel uh, PhD work that um, you might be doing in the context of uh, quantum computing, quantum technology, uh, whether it is the QTI or not, okay? Uh, the other is also academia. So if uh, if you know, or, or you are one of, of the people, or the lecturers teaching at the university and is interested in just uh, touching on, on one of our areas of interest, please do not hesitate to contact us. Our contact uh, address is in the Indico event that is uh, that you are receiving regularly with these lectures. Uh, and also I remind you before you depart is that Oriel is interested in having a, a wider discussion or sort of a debate or forum with those of you who are interested after the questions belonging specifically to the presentation that he has made. So the floor is open. Oh, we have already, so the floor is open. I yeah, don't so know. Yes, well, so, so the, the question I mean, is, go ahead. The question is, do we need a mitigation on better device? Uh, so I didn't try better device yet, so I cannot really answer that for the specific case we're considering. I would assume um, any device that you have right now is not good enough to do anything really meaningful. So if you don't do like really a small test, you even with a radiation, it won't really work. I guess. Okay. And if you do, if you, if you do QDrift, you also need. Though what is great with QDrift is that so if you you can basically reduce it n, so you can reduce the number of samples and increase instead M. So you can basically run a lot of really shallow uh, circuit. So decrease N, increase M. And so maybe with that, you can run on current devices, though this is where, this will probably be a lot of circuits. So if you don't have uh, access a lot to, uh, if you don't have, yeah. So decrease N, increase M might help a lot. Okay. Is, uh, any more people? Do not be shy. Thank you, Mr. Bergano, by the way. I don't see anybody, uh, anybody wants to comment, feedback. <laughs> uh, uh, we have another from Mateo. So, uh, Mateo, if you want to express it yourself also, feel comfortable. Huh? You don't need to have it all written. Yeah, okay, I can. Do you hear me? Yeah, but yes. Please do. Yeah, yes. I mean, yeah. Um, no, my my question, I think it's, an, it's a dumb question related to Kudrift algorithm. The point is, um, uh, if I understood, and maybe here it can help me, uh, the entire evolution is performed by calling once uh, one Hamiltonian for each step, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in general, if the Trotter formula also in the first order is performed by, call, by calling twice, the Hamiltonian is convenient with respect to Trotter, simple, I mean, with, the, with respect to the standard Trotter evolution or not. By default, I, in, I, mean, Trotter, in, I mean, in Trotter, you have to call every Hamiltonian once or twice, depending yep. on the order of your formula. And in QGIF, you have the, 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 the you call n times random terms. So you yeah. need to choose a number of samples depending on the accuracy you want and the norm and the time, et cetera. And then the number is fixed. So the number is not okay. really dependent on, on L. So if, okay. Okay. if the Hamiltonian has a lot of terms, it's going to be better for with QDrift. <clears throat> yes, of course. Okay, thank you. So, so basically you call only a part of the Hamiltonian each step. And in the end, uh, with a lot of calls, the result is the same at the first order. Yeah, so it's an unbiased estimator okay. of uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of the field. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Matteo. Um, it seems that no more people is coming forward. Not really. Okay. 
Well, in that case, uh, so, sorry, before maybe we just depart, uh, is uh, people interested in just uh, sticking around and uh, having the discussion with Oriel? Raise your hand or do a sign or something in the, on the chat. Doesn't seem like that. Okay, so in that, ah, there is somebody. Ah, Mateo. Okay, so uh, one is, is enough because we can, then we can just uh, have the discussion tete a tete or a few more people if they want to. So uh, let's say formally we wrap up the presentation here and those who want to leave do and those who want to stay with Mateo, with Oriel and ourselves, please uh, stay around and, uh, and Oriel will continue driving this discussion. So thank you very much for having joined us and we look forward to the next presentation which is going to happen in two weeks and we look forward to see you back again. Thank you and by the way, happy Easter everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 So Oriel, uh, you are the master of the show. <laughs> I mean, I don't okay. know. It's more, if people want to discuss things, uh, or, or I'm happy say, to. <laughs> Ma Mateo, oh, yeah. who raised the, the hand? Uh, Mateo, do you want to steer yeah. a little bit the dialogue in the direction that you'd like it to have it? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, thanks. Uh, yes, I Many was thanks. interested in that, in the sense that, um, as you probably know, uh, one my re my recent work, uh, in my recent work, I used um, the trotter, um, the trotter formula to translating. To translate the, um, the the Hamilton into a circuit and then to use the adiabatic evolution for uh, like a machine learning model. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I, I'm going to present in the, the next future a bit, a bit of flexibility. But yeah, so I was trying to to think because I didn't know about the Q drift algorithm and it seems super interesting, above all with the important sampling strategy so yeah no i was simply interested in in implementing it in uh in kibo maybe or uh or yes or in trying to to see if such a strategy can be useful in a machine learning context in which we use the evolution for embedding for example the probability mm -hmm. density or something like that yeah yeah probably the main I guess the main thing you need to know is that in practice, you need quite a lot of samples to, to make it work. So okay. with factorization, you can, with only one call, is going to be probably enough, but probably the number of, in practice, you really need like a high um, you know, number of samples. So you might be pay attention to this. I guess okay. you, you know with, that- With a nine know, number of calls, what do you mean? I guess in the yeah. asymptotic limit, you are going to win with your drift, but in the you know the not asymptotic limit, it's not really clear how much samples you need to have uh, good accuracy. So you might you 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 might want to to be to play around and make sure you don't need uh, too many uh, samples. Mm -hmm. So it depends also okay. on the on the time on the. Yep. I guess what you, what you really need to 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 see. If, how does your Hamiltonian look like? Yeah, because yes, for now we, we use the single qubit Hamiltonian. I think that in that case is not useful. No, no but, because then <laughs> yes, no. of course, very, very, very <clears throat> example. But in the case in which we try to use a lot of qubits in order to, I don't know, represent some n-dimensional probability density functions, maybe. Yeah, I, I guess the, the main point is you want the distribution of the coefficient to be not uh, uniform. Mm -hmm. You want to have like a lot of them with small coefficient and a few of them with big coefficient. Mm -hmm. This is like the best scenario for your drift. And you also want the time, the evolution time, not to be too big. Okay. Because with Trotter, you can easily uh, fix that using a higher order or using like, you know, multiple Trotter steps. So you can avoid this problem with QDFs, you cannot really, except if you use like QSwift. Uh, so if you don't want to use QSwift, which is a bit challenging to implement in practice, I mean, it's not mm -hmm. straightforward, 
uh, you might want to limit yourself to small time duration. Okay. 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 No, I'm so I'm not sure it should be the right choice. But if one qubit Hamiltonian well, doesn't I mean, do trotter on this. <laughs> no. Yeah. Of course. I mean, trotter is maybe trotter yeah. is too much. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, because yes, if I want to represent um. A uh, complex probability density function probably I need time to represent it during the evolution. Yeah. So I don't know if a small step of evolution is enough. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. a, a small time. But yes, thank you. I think this is a very interesting new way. I mean, I, I need time to, to think about it, but thank you for the presentation. So Massimiliano or Bosson, I don't know if that is your first name or is him. Uh, would you like to intervene as well, since you stay with us? Uh, I had a very, very quick question, but uh, perhaps... Uh, um, can I text you because I'm in the office and uh, we are all talking? Maybe it's better. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. So it seems that we we call it a day, like they say in, in English. <laughs> we call it a talk. Yeah, otherwise we get also follow up by email. So it's yeah, more, uh, in the office. Okay. Yeah, Massimiliano. Anyway, uh, uh, but, uh, to Massimiliano in particular, if you need um, the contact of Oriel and you don't have it, I am happy to share it with you or Oriel himself. I mean, I I am happy to put you in contact if you need to. Yeah. So feel comfortable at that. So okay. with that, I think we wrap up. And, uh, Thank you very I, much for, for coming. It, it was a pleasure, Oriel, uh, to have you here. And again, for the rest of you, I mean, for those who are still <laughs> stick around, happy Easter <laughs> and see you. In